But the thing that happens so much is people are like, why do you want to talk to me? <laughs> and, I, and honestly, after having you come on now, people are going to say that even more. They're going to be like, you get important people on the show. Why do you want to talk to me? I was like, guys. Okay, first of all, the whole concept of the show is that the, the North is so unique. Yeah. And the people that end up here are so interesting and so unique. And anyone's life is interesting if you look close enough. You get such a variety of characters in these places. Like It's like this interesting sect of, like, uh, not sect, that's not the right word, but like section of human society that ends up up north. Yeah. And whether or not your family has been here for generations and, and you know, came from the mountains and things like that to someone who spends two weeks up here and then two weeks in Edmonton, you know, taking care of their stepkids. You're all part of the ecosystem in some way. And uh, who are you? You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the idea. And then people are always like, I got nothing to say. I was like, well, could we talk for an hour? And if we could talk for an hour, that's an episode. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. So welcome back to the Breaking Eyes podcast. My name is Josh Ferguson. And today we have the honor to sit down with Senator Paul, Paul Prosper. And thanks so much for coming on. It means a lot. I'm honored to be here and glad you asked for this uh, interview. It was it was funny because uh, I was doing one episode with McNeely, Danny McNeely, and he was, oh, the senator's coming to town. I was like, would he come on the show? And he's like, let me ask. And he just like rang up, rang somebody up. I'm not sure if he rang up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, that's very cool. So um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to to sit down and talk. And I guess my first question is, is like, where'd you grow up? Tell me about yourself. Okay. Well, I, I grew up in a small Mi'kmaq community called Bakunke. Okay. And it's in Nova Scotia. Uh, it, it's not much bigger than uh, this Norman Wells itself. We're just about around 600 residents there. Okay. It's a very familiar size. Yes. very Yeah, quite familiar. And so, yeah, I grew up there most of my life before um heading off to university and things like that so yeah and then um so you went to to school what'd you study i I, sci? No. <laughs> <laughs> well that's it that was it i started out um in um phys ed i i, I wasn't successful there I, I must have been like a christmas graduate <laughs> i so i flunked out of my first run at university went to boston uh, did some work in boston and then came back and um enrolled uh for a bachelor of arts at uh then it was called university college of cape breton okay now it's called cape breton university so I did I got a degree uh, for four years there, and then uh, enrolled in Dalhousie Law School. Okay, and then you know completed law school, and then when did your uh, when were you like I don't see I don't know when this happens for people, but they go you know what maybe I'm gonna run for the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> um, it it wasn't an active. Uh, thought in okay. my head because it, it just seemed so far removed sure and uh, you know so i worked for uh big ma leadership big ma organizations predominantly in nova scotia but for a bit there in prince edward island mm -hmm. so i did uh, advised chiefs uh and leadership and organizations primarily and uh, eventually became uh, a chief mm -hmm. myself cool. back in my community of Bakunke. So did that for about uh, seven years. And then an opportunity arose to uh, for me to run for regional chief okay. with the Assembly of First Nations representing Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And I was successful in doing that. And it just so happened that a long-term mentor of mine, a uh, respected individual, uh, former Senator Danny Christmas, was uh, the first Mi'kmaq senator. Okay. And uh, just through my work, I've been uh, before various committees, both uh, within the Senate and House committees, speaking to various issues 
But there was an occasion, it was Bill C-92 at the time, dealing with child welfare, where I was part of a, a team that went before the Senate committee. And so it happened, it was chaired by uh, then Senator Danny Christmas. Okay. And What a name, eh? I, I, Danny I, Christmas? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there, I think he has a relative that her first name is Mary. Oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's so awesome. I, I, I don't know. I think something clicked uh, in terms of this this whole different area. Yeah, something that was just completely off my radar. Well, you had experience running in the public sector, yeah. right? And then you had experience with leadership. So there is a kind of natural confluence there in terms of ending up in a place like this. What, 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 how did you, I'm interested in the decision to run for office. Cause I think public, uh, like, uh, what's it called? A, uh, civil re responsibility. Like there's, mm -hmm. that relies, that lies in every individual in, in, in democracy. Right. Yeah. And our system re relies on people getting involved. Absolutely. And how, how did you enjoy running? Like was running and was it an enjoyable experience for you? And there's this like difference, obviously you're like vying for a public position and it's more competitive, but compared to like, you know, in the pub private sector, it's very anonymous. So tell me about your experience of running. Okay. And it could be your first one. I, I'd actually prefer that because I think that would be the most impactful one maybe. Well, um, there, there's a number of thoughts that goes through a person's mind. Uh, it, it never really, uh, although my father was chief, mm -hmm. I had a couple brothers that were chief in, okay. in my community. Um, and I, I, I was just basically content with, you know, providing legal advice and, and, you know, doing that, but it it there were two people. Danny, uh, uh, former former Senator Christmas, played a role in that, and my sister Darlene okay. Prosper. She actually convinced me on two occasions to run for chief. The first time I ran was when I first just got out of law school. I okay. I wasn't successful. I I came close, but you don't get anything for me. Being close for sure is and is that what is that disappointing? Um, I I guess at the time you know uh, I I took it seriously. I, um, but you know at the time maybe, but you, you sort of realize that it was all meant to be. Uh, and so the second time she convinced me to run, um, I thought she was going to run, but. By the end of the night and after a couple of beers, I guess I was the one that was going to do it. <laughs> but um, but she had a very effective way of, because I was content with uh, providing advice and I would write speeches. And, and finally, she just told me, like, instead of being outside of the table, you can be sitting around the table mm. and... In terms of writing speeches, you can write your own speeches, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so, but I do think leadership it has a certain way of involving people to step forward. I think leaders, and there are many, not just political leaders. No, or, no, for sure. But they have that uh, capacity to step forward in times that require leadership. Yeah, I think I think um, a healthy you know, society and community requires leadership on, on every level. And, mm -hmm. and whether that be, you know, just, you know, taking, taking care of your nephew and, and sh being a mentor for him or her or, mm -hmm. or some, you know, like those small things go so far in terms of giving people the foundation of confidence that they need to be able to achieve something in their life. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, and you just mentioned it, it is an accomplishment, no matter how, people perceive it, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, has a way of, um, you know, be, where you're being of service to, yeah. to um, it could be a, to a family member, it could be to a friend, it could be to a community, it could be to a nation. And I think the coolest thing is once you start doing things like that, it gets easier and easier. 
right? So, and then you can have a bigger and bigger impact on your community. And if more people do that, well, you know, that would be, that'd be awesome, right? That's the goal. (laughs) Absolutely. And, you know, there there have been just numerous people that um, provided that opportunity to me to feel that level of, to just witness leadership yeah. and, and to see it operate. And like, yeah, like my mother, she was an incredible leader. She was, a, a, you know, a very um, generous person, uh, not only within family, but within community. Mm-hmm. Similarly, uh, you know, my father and siblings, things uh, as well. So yeah, some people say it's in your blood. I, I, I don't know, but um, maybe it's just a situation of where you witness it more often. Yeah, I was I was about to agree that it might seem like it might be in your blood, but it's just about exposure. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I, I'm so it sounds like your family is very involved and and kind of has been a part of leadership for a long time. How did how like can you kind of give me a sense of what your childhood was like and 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 how that impacted you and shaped your views till today? Sure. It's a huge question. Uh, it, it is. <laughs> I, I mean, but it's an interesting question. Um, well, I, I grew up in a, a big family. It was a family of 14. Uh, my father died when I was two, thereabouts. Um, and, you know, so they, they were humble beginnings mm-hmm. um, with a single mother on a reserve. And I got to witness how, you know, this one person was able to raise all my siblings, brothers and sisters. And it it takes a lot of coordination Um, just with older siblings. I I was the second youngest. So um, you, you have older siblings stepping forward, taking on certain roles and responsibilities. Uh, Since it was a a fairly small community, uh, we were all quite close within the community and uh, surrounding communities as well. So it, it, I, I'll, I certainly wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Um, Those humble beginnings you know, growing up in a big family uh, in a, and you said 14. So is that 12 siblings or, well, uh, 14. Oh, okay. Uh, 13 siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full 14 children. Yeah. She yeah. sounds like a badass. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, my mom would, you know, uh, take in other, you know, um, if there were, you know, families having a hard time uh, facing certain struggles, she would sort of take in uh, some of those children as well. Um, so um, your sister who is encouraging you to run for chief and and – uh, where is she in the array of siblings? Was she a mentor to you always, or was she? I yeah, I I, I like to because she was certainly a leader in her own right, uh-huh. an entrepreneur. Uh, she was on council uh, numerous times. She had a a lot of integrity. Uh, she had an incredible heart. She helped lots of people within the community, uh, you know, and just. I would see how she would care and help. It reminded me a lot about my mother uh, as well. So um, we just shared that relationship. And she was counselor way before I became chief. But when she convinced me to run for chief uh, the second time when I was successful, she ran for council and both of us got in at the time, oh, cool. which was great. So we had that opportunity where her and I got to work together. What a special thing. Oh, so special and so necessary. I don't know how I would have done it without her um, because it, it was a busy time, you know, when you're starting out and, you know, you you, you have ideas, but it takes a lot to put those ideas uh, into action. Yeah, and and that like uh caliber of leadership is difficult because it's 
like I don't know how long the term is. What is it? Two years. It's two. Okay, so that's not very long at all. Like, no. <laughs> like no. you just start wrapping your mind around all the variables, and then it's like, oh, we got to run again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's amazing how quick two years goes. Um, you know, I, I would hear sometimes, you know, community members say like, well, it's an election year. And then I would sort of say in my mind, like, well, don't you know every other year is an election year? I mean, and when you're in a small community, it takes a while uh, for community members maybe to get over the last election result. So, you know. <laughs> and then you're in it again. <laughs> you're in, yeah, you're, you get a bit of a reprieve and then you're, you're back into it. Um. That's so cool. It's really interesting to it's it's interesting to understand your background and, and hear about your family. I think that's uh so um I don't know, it's just I think it's illuminating in terms of the work that you're doing now. Mm. So when you won the race for Senate, was that like surreal? Like what was that moment like? Wow. Um I always sort of like I, I mentioned previously, I never really contemplated becoming a senator or being a senator. It was just beyond the pale of my imagination. Uh, but for uh, Senator, former Senator Danny Christmas being appointed, um, it, it became, it was on my radar. And then when he retired, was contemplating retirement, he was obviously quite concerned about succession. Mm -hmm. And he approached a number of people within the Mi'kmaq Nation. And I was one of those persons he approached at the time. I was regional chief uh, with the Assembly of First Nations. And when he approached me, I, I said, I'll think about it for sure. And I thought about it, and it, it it's sort of like an appointment process. Okay, okay. So I'm, I might be completely ignorant until how this works. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, um, which is a bit of a godsend because <laughs> you know it's not a two year term, uh, but you know, uh, so you're appointed by the uh, governor general uh -huh. uh, with advice from uh, the prime minister, and uh, so it it it's. A process that's cloaked with a, a lot of secrecy, and I guess as it should be. And I, I you know, put in my application, uh, and it took what I considered to be a fairly long time. I, I, I thought it was over because I, nobody called me, nobody got in touch with me, and I just sort of resolved myself to the fact that okay, I, I gave it a go. Sure. And then I, I just got this call. I, I remember I was in Vancouver speaking at a conference and it was a follow-up call where they said, are you still interested in being a senator? And I said, yes. And, um, and then uh, it sort of culminates where uh, you get a call from the prime minister. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, almost like... Yeah, just that one of those final steps of uh, becoming a senator. Yeah, so, it's like the final, like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it solidifies it. Yeah. yeah, and I guess every senator um, gets. How many senators are there? 109. Okay. Or 105. Okay. <laughs> I'll edit that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, there, there's 10. Uh, it, the formula is set out in the constitutional and. What's that? Sorry, five minute warning. You have to check in. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, shit. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, I guess we'll just jump into our next section here. But what what what, what brings you up here now? Well, um, uh, it started with uh, an incredible leader, uh, Senator Anderson. With uh, you know the, her region is the Northwest Territory. Mm -hmm. I've met Senator Anderson. Yes, incredible leader. Uh, indicated mm -hmm. uh, a pressing matter that was going on in our region involving, um, you know, um, certainly the community of Norman Wells, but also uh, the com community of Toledo mm -hmm. as well, with respect to. Uh, the challenges they are facing with uh, the rising costs of 
gas slash it's diesel. Brutal. It's um, brutal. But for certain conditions, uh, uh, climate change, I would imagine, involving you know uh, low levels within the Mackenzie River, um, the depleting timeline uh, or period for uh, the ice roads to be open for heavy traffic. Yeah, the, the, all of the all of the different. Um, criteria kind of culminating in this situation is, mm -hmm. is, you know, it, it's hard to specifically point fingers when so many things are coming together like this, regardless that we need to find a solution, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and how has been your experience of, of, you know, making the trip and, and coming up here and feeling, having boots on the ground? Well, it, it, it also stemmed from a meeting I had with, uh, Danny McNeely, your your local yeah, that's right in Ottawa, right when everyone went down and the yes. and the mayor and and Frank and Doug uh, Yali yeah from Toledo yes and um, uh, there was a fairly good contingent there and you know it it that discussion really uh, resonated with me where you have some hard realities sure. uh, of w what is being experienced here. And the one thing that resonated in my mind was that you got to come here to experience it. It's true. It's true. And, and, I, and you, you, I would say you've even showed up at a point when like the reality has kind of set in a little bit, people are hopeful, mm -hmm. but right at the beginning, like the air was thick here and it was a very scary time, um, especially with so much uncertainty. And, you know, the thing that, the thing that's, well, personally, I feel very fortunate. I heat with wood, so I have, mm. I'm not looking at the heating fuel costs. Obviously, there's a lot of other costs that I'm looking at that are yeah. affecting me like everybody else. But um, yeah, it's it just kind of luck of the draw but in terms of like who needs to fill up when and things yeah. like that. And unfortunately, like the, the families that I feel for the most are the families that maybe didn't have enough money to heat up in this or fill up in the spring and thought, you know what, we'll just wait till the fall until right before winter. <laughs> And then wow. something like this happens, and absolutely, you know, I uh, it, it's something that I know I can't fully uh, phantom like the, sure. the the implications of that, but you know what I've heard uh, through certain written oral accounts is quite. Um, it's an item that really uh, motivates a person to try to help in whatever way possible we can. And and is there a mechanism or, or as a senator, is there a way that you can be helpful other than kind of bringing it, uh, eyes to the situation? And you know, that is also helpful. Like attention is very important, mm. right? And But I just don't, again, I don't know. Well, I mean, there, there, there's certainly mechanisms that we're aware of. I mean, but you, you have some very able leadership here. I'm very pleased with, with the amount of effort they're putting into it. Incredible leadership. Uh, they're examining uh, many of the opportunities and options that is available in front of them. Uh, there's a lot of strategic thinking and, and expertise that they have in that regard. So there's it ably taking uh, a, an incredible lead in that regard. I mentioned uh, Senator Anderson as well. So, so certainly my role is to, you know, support them in whatever efforts possible sure. to um, use my contacts within Ottawa yeah. to provide a forum or a mechanism for their issues to come forward and to resonate with with all parliamentarians, because this is a critical situation. And, you know, people have to be quite cognizant of the fact of, uh, you know, these realities, uh, because if they were placed in similar circumstances, uh, they would certainly resonate with the dire need for real action to occur now. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly. And it's, it's the fact that it's happening to such a small place that's so isolated mm. is like compounds it. You know what I mean? Like so many people already have so many high costs. The cost of just living up here is, is was already high, but it was something that everyone was 
you know, accepted with the decision to live here. There's so many upsides. You live in a beautiful place. There is the, you almost feel like you lived 30 years ago in a lot of ways in oh. terms of the kind of uh, community experience that you have. And uh, so there's so many upsides to it, but then you kind of get these drastic, sobering moments when you're like, mm. we're vulnerable up here. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, you know, there, there's something special, uh, certainly about my experience being up here. And, you know, it, it is, you know, something that reminds me, you know, a fair bit of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people, you know, how open they are, how generous they are, how hopeful they are how resilient they are, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's so refreshing to have that experience and to just feel connected and to be of service. You know, that's my job. Yeah, you certainly. Know, to, to help those in need and to bring the issues to the forefront. Well, we, I, I don't think it, I'm not sure how many people know of your, of your visit up here, but mm -hmm. for those who do, and, and even for those who don't, it is an honor to have you here. And, and it means a lot to have, you know, people who are relevant, who are involved and who are paying attention to actually come here. Cause it, it can so often feel like, yeah, it's only 600 people. Yeah. And they might say, well, where's Norman Wells? Anyway? Yeah, exactly. like, like, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. But I, I, I just want to, you know, also recognize your efforts, mm. uh, Josh, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, bringing uh, these issues forward, uh, talking to the many people that you do, um, and to just, you know, being part of community and contributing to community, I think is so important. Mm -hmm to share that notion of spirit, you know, um, it's truly an incredible thing. And I just want to recognize you for that. Thank you. Just before we close, I know that we're doing that. Um, are you optimistic for the future? Generally or with respect to this issue? Uh, you could answer both. <laughs> I, I am optimistic because, you know, the situation, uh, the situation as it is, something has to happen like mm -hmm. uh, when, when when you're at a situation where you, things need to improve then you're starting at a, a really critical area and it it, it does impact people differently mm -hmm. uh, for myself uh, you know i like to take that on as a challenge mm -hmm. um and so by nature i guess i have a fair bit of optimism i i, I do um but that's something I sense out here as well. Yeah. Is, you know, I remember when I became chief within my community of Bakunke, the first thing I thought of was, oh my God, all the things that could go wrong in this community. And, you know, I, I felt like, you know, curling up under the desk in a fetal position. And, yeah. But but you realize that it, it takes a lot of people to make a community work. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have to get up in the morning and make a community work. Oh, yeah. And, and on every level, all the people contributing from fixing the pipes to being leaders, it's all it, almost as important. Oh, oh <laughs> it is. It's of critical importance. Um, you know, like I, I, I used to worry about the things I didn't see. Sure. Things that were under the ground. Yeah. Many things can happen in a community like my community of Bakunke, but if people don't have water, you hear about it. Yeah, that's you know? critical. That's absolutely critical. So I, I just admire that idea of community spirit and how everyone contributes and uh, that sense of optimism. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. And and uh, it, again, it really means a lot to to have a presence and, and people paying attention to the situation because, yeah, it, feel, it can feel really lonely and abandoned up here and um um yeah thank again just thanks for coming i don't know it means a lot thank you yeah. so much you uh, take care you're welcome on anytime if you're back in norman wells back in the south too hope maybe we can do a full hour and and get to know you more I, I certainly would love that and i certainly would like to be back awesome well thank you take care john bye now <laughs>